Amen. So we're going to start in a kind of a weird way. Um, celebrity couples. Not you. No. Celebrity couples. One of the weird things about celebrity couples in our culture is, is um, we kind of follow all the things that they do and they know it. And, and so when they're, they're married and, and they get divorced, they put out these press releases about their divorce, which we're so thankful for. Yes? <laughs> and um, I don't want to come across uncaring, but just sometimes you look at the words that they're trying to choose for it, and sometimes it's a little bit, it's a little bit weird, and you know what they're try- trying to reach for, and it's fine. But there was one just recently I was reading, and they said, yeah, we're getting divorced. They said, we're still best friends. We're just going on different journeys. Okay. I don't know how, if, if you're divorcing, if, if you're going to be apart now, you're going to still be best friends in the way that you were. I, I really appreciate that they're wanting to be nice. I really appreciate that they're saying, hey, we're not committed to destruction or hatred toward each other. Like, I like all of that, right? Like, that's good. I appreciate that. But just, like, we're still going to be best friends? I don't know. And, and, and the reason that doesn't make a ton of sense to me is because there's something about being present together in the same house, seeing each other every single day, that is exactly the thing that makes us deeply connected to each other. It's exactly what deepens our relationship and makes the bonds really, really tight. And when we start to pull apart, that's when the bonds of our friendship start to loosen, yes? I mean, it's really basic stuff. So especially in a marriage, like, you want to live in the same house, right? Like, that's pretty basic. Like, you want to sleep in the same bed. You want to have good quality time together. Even your, your careers can start to pull you apart. Other priorities can start to pull you apart. Presence matters. Distance makes distance. It's really what I'm trying to say. And when Linda and I moved from Illinois, we had a whole lot of friendships there and important friendships, and we moved here. It was just an unavoidable experience that we had that some of those relationships, because of the distance, started to loosen. And some of you have had that experience as military families. You PCS'd here, and you left relationships behind, and you've experienced that lessening of the bond. Yes, it's just, it just happens. And Then some of you go on deployments and you've told me about the fact that when you're on deployment in another country and and you've got family that's still here, you'll do everything you can to be on FaceTime with your family every single night. And what are you doing? You're trying to fight against that lack of presence. And praise God for you, by the way. Praise God for those stories amongst you where, where you're doing everything you can to keep the bonds of family and marriage as tight as they possibly can. Thank God for FaceTime. But presence matters. Presence matters even in the church. To be together with the family of God matters. And not just on a Sunday morning, because it has to do with the bond that we all have together, yes? And, and, and when you get into life groups and you form even deeper bonds with those people, study the word together, and you go on over prayer requests together, and you, you share each other's lives together. It's like all of that also matters. And, and your walk with Jesus presence matters. Are you walking with Jesus today? Are you spending time in prayer with him and listening to him and opening up his word and seeing what kind of manna he's got for you today? Are you integrating Jesus into your life and prioritizing that friendship that you have with him over and over and over again? See, that presence matters. It keeps your bonds with the living God strong. So we're talking today about presence. This is, this is what David is going to say to us in Psalm 23. Now I'm going to read Psalm 23 to you. This is our last week in Psalm 23. The most popular psalm in scripture. You guys all know this one. I'll read it to you just one last time for this series because we're doing verse 6 today. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you remember? And I shall not want. I don't need anything else in my life. I'm the sheep if God is my shepherd. And then he makes me lie down in green pastures so I can eat the grass. God wants food for me. Amen to food. And he leads me beside still waters. He's taking care of all my needs. He restores my soul. He restores me to me, the scripture says. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Not my paths, his paths. And we struggle with that. Get on God's path. And if you're on God's path, sometimes you're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, verse 4. But if you do, if you, if you come into those valleys, you don't have to fear any evil. Why? Because he's with you. 
because you're not alone. And not only are you not alone, but his rod and his staff, they comfort you. These are the weapons and the encouragements of God. We talked about that week. God is packing. Amen. Amen. God is packing. Then verse five, you prepare a table. This is where the picture changes. It's not shepherd and sheep anymore. Now I'm a peasant and I'm invited into the king's house for a feast, a feast that he's laid out just for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's great honor. You anoint my head with oil. That's God lifting us up and honoring us and choosing us because he actually likes us, doesn't just love us. My cup overflows with God's generous blessing. And surely today, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I've so enjoyed this psalm. So today's verse, two pieces, the twins. First, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You've got somebody following you, is what he says. There's like two bodyguards behind you at all times, no matter where you are, following behind you is goodness and mercy, God's goodness and God's mercy. Isn't that encouraging today that you're never alone? It's just another way to say it. And, 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 and all God's good blessings and his, his wisdom and his, his favor and his calling and his presence, it's all there in that goodness. And then that word mercy that, that's up there, mercy is probably not a word as we would understand it in the New Testament, um, where we get, maybe there would be God's righteous judgment, what justice is, and then we get something that's more merciful. That's not what that Hebrew word means there. What it means is his steadfast love. His steadfast love would have been a better interpretation of that. His steadfast love, well, why is that important? Because a lot of times in our life, we've had love that is not steadfast. We've had love that failed us. Anybody? Some of the greatest hurts in your life are when someone claimed that they would love you forever and then didn't. And you offended them or you disappointed them or you didn't, you didn't measure up to what they needed you to do. And all of a sudden, their love stopped. And that stopping of love hurts you deeply. And so God's coming and saying, I bring a steadfast, stubborn love that will never, ever divorce you. It will never stop loving you. It will never give up on you. It will never walk away no matter what you do. Can I get a better amen on that one? Man, we need that. The steadfast love of God. It's going to follow us. And then the second phrase, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now that's, that's an interesting, unique kind of statement that David is making there. King David, shepherd David. David is the one who wrote this psalm. David says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, most of the times in the past, whenever I get to that phrase, it's at the end and he talks about forever. I just think heaven, right? Like he's saying, oh, goody, I get to be with God in heaven. And on some level, that's absolutely true what he's saying there. But look closer. He's saying more because he's not just saying, I'm going to be with God in heaven. He's saying, I want to be in the house of the Lord forever the house of the Lord. That's a unique way to say that, David. Why why house of the Lord? The house of Yahweh. What in the world is the house of Yahweh? The house of Yahweh in David's time as a Jewish boy growing up in the the Jewish faith, right? It's like this is after Moses freed the children of Israel out of Egypt and they wandered through the desert and they set up camp in the promised land. The house of God was the tabernacle. It was the tent. That's what David grew up with. So don't don't think cathedrals, don't think temple, think the tent. Like the tent is where God's presence would be. It's it's where he would go to worship. And they had the, I mean, if you know the Old Testament, they they had the different pieces of furniture in there and, and, and they had the table of showbread and the altar of incense and they had the bronze altar and they had all these things going on. Eventually you went into the Holy of Holies, which no one could go except to the high priest once a year. And and the Ark of the Covenant was in there the very presence of God at the mercy seat itself. And so David, that's, that's what church was for him, was going to the tabernacle and worshiping God in that way. And David says, I want to live in the tabernacle for eternity. Could you imagine saying, I would like my Sunday morning church experience to just keep going for eternity. Some of you are lying in church right now. 
Psalm 27, 4 is another place where David says something similar. He says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the, the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple for he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. David says again, I want to be in God's house every single day. I just, I just want someone to set me up a cot so I could just live there. And he says, so I can inquire of the Lord. I can bring my questions right to him. I don't have to travel to it. I can just sit there and meditate all day long. I don't have to worry about my crops. Don't have to worry about my kingdom. Don't have to worry about any of these things. I just get to sit and think about God. That's his dream. And he wants to do it forever. There's an old hymn that says, you can have all this world, but just give me Jesus. You can have, you can have all of it. I just want this. And that's what David is trying to say here. Would you want to be in God's house every single day and then forever? When I was a kid growing up, they would come to me as a good church kid and say, you like, you want to be in heaven forever, right? And you would dutifully say yes. Even though the pictures that I had in my mind at that time were of like a little cherub with wings and a little harp sitting on a cloud looking very, very bored. And they would say, you want to be in heaven forever, right? Uh-huh. But not really. Because that looks really terrible as an existence, right? Like, so, so sometimes people will even say to you in your adult faith, like, you want to be in heaven forever. And, and sometimes you've had maybe a picture in your mind of like, well, it's probably going to be like the church services and, and I don't know, maybe we're going to be in heaven and it's going to be some outdated 90s worship tune and they're just going to play it on a loop and we're just going to have to muscle through it for all eternity before God's throne, right? Yeah, I really want that, you know? <laughs> Can we be honest? <laughs> we want more than that. Yeah, like we, we want something different than that. What does David mean? Are you excited to be in heaven forever? So I'm going to break down what I, think he, what I think we mean here by this phrase, house of God. And I'm going to try and get it really, really focused for us. So it's three different things. But the very first thing house of God is for us is it's a place or it's a the place. So for David, again, it was, it was that tabernacle. It was that tent. Um, for us, it's this kind of church experience. And maybe we've got mixed feelings about it, mixed feelings about the place, right? Maybe you've got mixed feelings about the church in America. Maybe you've got mixed feelings about the carpet, you know, because it's kind of old. And maybe you've got mixed feelings about me as the pastor. Maybe you've got mixed feelings about the programs that are here at the church. There's a whole lot of things you could have mixed feelings about, about the place, yes? And then you've got the people that could tweak you just a little bit because you're like, wow. Does heaven mean, does heaven mean I'm, I'm going to be stuck with these people? Because we're too old or we're too young or we're too traditional. And maybe you don't like their politics or our politics or um, maybe we're too judgmental, too cruel, too gossipy. Um, pick any of those qualities, right? Like we're too, all of those things, or it gets to the really, really big one, right? Where it's like, it, it, it's maybe not even that. It's the fact that people in the church hurt me deeply. And, and maybe they just didn't hurt me deeply. Maybe they hurt the people I love very deeply. So yeah, I've got really mixed feelings about being stuck with this group of people forever and ever. So you got the place and you got the people and then, then finally, you've got the presence. But before I hit the presence, just really quick, I'll just say, when David says, I want to spend eternity forever in the house of God, I don't think he means the people, and I don't think he means the place. I think he means the presence. But even though that's the case, you know that the church is the people, right? Right? And you know that even with their brokenness and the mess that is the church, there's something about us learning to love the messy, broken group of people that is the church. 
not by denying their faults, but saying we love them in spite of, we love us in spite of those faults. And why do we love us in spite of those faults? Because Jesus does. Because he calls us the bride of Christ and he chooses to love the unlovable. And the more we walk out the path of Jesus and decide, even when it's difficult to try to love the unlovable church, here's what starts to happen. Number one, you start to develop in yourself a love that looks like Jesus's love. But number two, it starts to dawn on you when you do that, that if I can love the church, maybe Jesus can love me. Because that's the one question that's really down deep underneath all of it. Does God still, does God actually, could God possibly love me with all my problems? Just something to think about. The presence. The presence is what I believe he really means. The house of God forever. The presence. And here's the reason why. Is because God's presence was actually there in the, the tabernacle. Um, again, not a cathedral, not a temple. Don't think about it like that. When God had Moses himself build this tabernacle, this tent with everything for worship, it was humble and it was mobile. Okay, it was not, it was not all built of solid gold. It was not this gorgeous thing to look at. It was a tent. But number two is it was mobile. Why was it mobile? Because God wanted to move them around. And in our humanity, we often want God and the worship of God to be something static and gorgeous and big and massive like a cathedral and never move. And God wants to move. And so he chooses a tent and that's what David had. And the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies and God's presence was actually there and they knew it. And I say Ark of the Covenant, I just have to reference Indiana Jones because I can't not reference Indiana Jones in this moment. But they had it wrong, of course. Like they did a really beautiful representation of what it might have looked at, like with the mercy seat and the angels on top and all that kind of stuff. But it was not a weapon of war. It was not something that melted people's faces off, even though that was cool to watch. Um, but that's not what it was. What it was is it was, it was, it was God's holiness and power was actually there. And it was there above the mercy seat with such potency that one time a year, only one time of year, the high priest was allowed to go in with the sacrifice for the people, the day of atonement. And he could make a sacrifice for the people on the day of atonement. And if his heart wasn't right and it wasn't being done right, he could be struck dead in that moment because the power of God, presence of God was so potent there. They knew God was there. When David says, I want to be in the house of God forever, when he prayed and when he was in that place making his sacrifices, he knew God was there. That matters. Okay, I want to talk about this, this place and, and the, the fact that God desires his presence to be with us. So I've got a slide up on the screen. I'm just going to move through these steps really quick. If you're not taking notes yet, this is a spot to take notes because I'm going to move through this really, really fast. But I want you to know that God desires to be with us. And it started in the garden, right? I'm right there in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve and in that perfect garden. And the scripture says that God spoke to them face to face in the cool of the day. Can you imagine that? Because you need to imagine that just really quick. That nothing is in the way of God. He's not invisible to you. You hear his voice. You have fellowship, actual friendship with the living God right there. Because everything's perfect, guys. Nothing's in the way. And it's not until they sin and all of a sudden that, that angel with the flaming sword comes and has to bar Eden from them so that they can't eat from the tree of life anymore and live forever and be in God's presence forever. Why? Because they had sinned. All of a sudden humanity did what humanity does. We said, God, you were on the throne. I'd like that chair, please. God, it was your agenda before. I'd like it to be my agenda. I'd like, it to, I'd like to rely on me, not rely on you. And then here comes my cruelty and here comes my selfishness and here comes everything in its wake. And as soon as we refuse God's rule, it breaks us and God. And so sin broke them and they had to be distant now. But even though they had to be distant, that was not God's desire. I'm gonna show that to you. So the next spot is the pillar. Now that's after Moses had 
freed the children of Israel out of Egypt and they're going through the desert. And if you've read that, you, you know that God appeared to them as a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke during the day because he wanted them to know he was there. And it was so visible. It was so, it, it was so known and understood. It, it was unapproachable. It intimidated them. If you look in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh's army was chasing them right before they went into the Red Sea. Some of you guys remember that from the movie. And they were chasing them and all of a sudden they saw the pillar of fire and it freaked Pharaoh's army out. That's why they stood back. So it wasn't just visible to God's people, it was visible to anybody. God was coming near, one group of people. God was coming near. But even though he was near, it was unapproachable. Then in the tabernacle, God said, I want to be near you all the time and I want you to be able to come into this place and worship me and talk with me. But we got to deal with your sin. And so that's why there had to be this sacrifice that was made. Because the sacrifice, the biblical language is, it covered their sin. It didn't make their sin go away. It didn't deal with their sin for all time. And it had to be repeated every single year. That same ceremony had to be repeated every single year. It was God's way of saying, your sin has to be dealt with in order for us to have a relationship. But also, isn't this a pain that it has to be done over and over again? And also, isn't it a pain that it's only one group of people called the Jews and not the whole world? Enter Jesus. Jesus. John chapter 1. It says, and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became man and he made his dwelling among us. Do you remember that verse? When Jesus came, he was Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We sing that every year at Christmas, Emmanuel. It means God with us because God's desire from the beginning is always to be present with his people. He wants friendship. And so Jesus comes and some of the, some of the um, uh, translations say he pitched his tent amongst us. And then, of course, Jesus not only came to the Jews, but he came to all people, Gentiles included. And then Jesus died for all of our sins on the cross. And the way that the scripture describes it to us is he died for sins once for all. And it never has to be done again. No sacrifice ever has to be made again because Jesus' sacrifice covers all. And then once Jesus did that, then the Spirit came in the book of Acts. Because Jesus was now with us in this world, but when the Spirit came, he came to show that God was inside of us. He was in us, which is a whole different level of thing. And that might mess with you just a little bit. Here's a picture from the book of Acts. And this was after Jesus died and was resurrected, went up into heaven. The spirit came. And when the spirit came and descended on all the people there, it said that it was like a little tongue of fire appeared over their head. Every single one of them individually. Why? Because it was God's sign that you all get the Holy Spirit. You all get the presence of God inside you in such a way that you don't go to a temple anymore for it. You are the temple. That's the way the New Testament describes it. And then they quoted this old prophet who said, in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And slave and free will get it. And Jew and Gentile will get it. And man and woman will get it. And old and young will get it. Everybody will get it. That's why you can walk around and you can talk to God even in your car. That's why you can confess your sin out in the, the Wichita mountains. You can confess your sin out there if you would like to. You don't have to be in here. When I was a kid, the old guys would tell me I couldn't wear a hat in church. Some of you hat guys are feeling guilty right now. <laughs> the thing is, they were wrong. You can wear a hat in church. But they were, they were looking at this, this old idea of, hey, when you're praying... You shouldn't wear a hat maybe in that culture and, 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 and usually that happened in church. So if you're in church, that was a special holy place and you shouldn't wear your hat there. But see, they were wrong. They were looking at my little Baptist church and they were thinking that's the temple of God where God's spirit is. And they were wrong. Sometimes people would say you can't wear those jeans in church or you can't swear in church or you can't lie in church. They're talking about God's spirit as like this special holy place existed inside of a building. It's not true. See, you take church wherever you go because you've got the Holy Spirit now. 
if anything, it's harder, right? Because it's not, it's not don't lie in church, but you can lie outside in the parking lot. You can't lie anywhere now. Like you ought to pray everywhere now because you're taking God with you. Sometimes people will ask me questions like, why don't we put more crosses up? Do you know why? There's a reason for it. It's not just because we're trying to be hip. The reason we don't put a lot of crosses up or a lot of stained glass and things like that, and I know some of you guys came from that and you love that, but I don't want to give any more excuse to people to believe that this place is holy because it's not. I don't want to confuse anybody. This is just a structure, guys. You take the Holy Spirit with you. You are the temple of the living God, and he wants it that way. So this is the way that we walk with the Spirit today. And then ultimately, the ultimate culmination of all of this is that the city, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. And that's the new heavens and the new earth when we're finally, not just spiritually, but we're physically face to face with God again. Nothing in the way. So do you see how it begins face to face with God? And then everything breaks And then we get all the way to the end and God has fully restored us back to a place where we can be face to face with him again. Do you see the personality of a passionate God who wants to be with you? Because that's what this is all about. So are you walking with God? Are you walking with Jesus? Are you experiencing his presence? That's the question. Because... If you are not, then when David says, I would rather do this experience for all the rest of eternity, it's not going to make sense to you. Does it make sense? <laughs> there's, a, there's a scripture in the Psalms that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I love that because you have to taste it in order to understand it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The implication is if you haven't tasted it, you won't know he's good. It'll be theory to you and you can read that in a book and maybe get it right on a test, but you won't know it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When Linda and I had our 25th wedding anniversary um, a couple years ago, we drove to Austin, Texas because the world-renowned Franklin barbecue was down there. And it's the best barbecue. And while we were there um, celebrating such a momentous occasion in our marriage, and Linda set all this up, by the way, What a loving woman. Um, We had brisket from this place. And I can tell you, it is the best brisket I've ever tasted in my life. It is probably the best in the world. Now, some of you are like, I don't know that I agree with you, pastor. (laughs) And I would say, you haven't tasted it. (laughs) If you had tasted it, you might feel different. Yes? Proof's in the pudding, right? Yeah. Yeah. Taste and see that the Lord is good is what David's saying. So he comes to the end of it and he's saying, I've had this life with Yahweh where I've actually experienced his presence and it is so good. It is my whole life. It's like he's addicted to the idea of being with God like this. And he's like, this is so good. I want it for all eternity. And some of us read that passage. We're like, that's nice poetic language, David. Way to go. Way to write something beautiful, but it's probably not real. It's real. God was there and God is here and God can be in your life. He wants to be in your life. Is he in your life? Have you had that experience of him? Sometimes religion, sometimes religion is a philosophy and it's a group of people and it's a set of activities that we do And then there's things that we believe. And some of us think that we don't actually believe them. We just say we believe them. And I'm not going to ruin anybody's childhood, but there were things that you said you believed in your childhood. And then later you found out you didn't believe those things anymore. Yes? That's just part of the experience. And we played that little believe game. And it was fun. And then you got older and you don't play that little believe game anymore unless there are kids in the room. And I get it. And there's a whole host of us every single Sunday that look at God's word, look at this whole thing and and say, I think we're playing the believe game again. 
I'm just going to let that sit out there for a second. God was there. His power, his holiness, his presence was there. And they experienced it. Have you experienced it? And when I say, have you experienced it? I'm not trying to create insiders and outsiders. That's not my point. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty or make you feel small or anything like that. I'm just trying to tell you today, there's something that is real and solid at the center of the Christian faith. It's real and it's solid. And if you've not come face to face with it yet, you haven't found the real thing. Not really. Has God spoken to you before? Have you known his presence before? And some of you are like, well, what's God's presence? Is it, is it when the music swells at a certain point, right? And it kind of builds to this spot where all of a sudden the goosebumps go up on the back of our neck? The answer is no. That's not what the presence of God is. That's fun. And I love those moments. Yes, I love them. It's so great. It's, it's not even moments where things get tense in the sermon and, and, and we all feel something together. That's not the presence of God. The presence of God is when God decides himself to show up in a moment. And he pushes his presence into a moment because he wants to for you. And there's, there's no sequence of things that you can do, series of steps that you can take that make God show up. It just doesn't work that way. God will not be controlled by you. If you know him and you know his personality, you know that he is far too stubborn for that. God will do what he chooses to do. And I don't mean stubborn in a negative way. I mean stubborn in the sense that his will is his will and his will is wise and it is right and he will not allow no human being to control him. So this idea that like we put services together or, or certain people can write beautiful songs and that makes God's spirit come, it does not. God decides to show up. Has he shown up in your life? Have you found him? Have you seen him? Because that's the whole thing, guys. Because if he has, then you are addicted to that pretty well instantly. And once you're addicted to it, your whole rest of your, your spiritual life with God will be seeking after him to show up in your life again and again and again and again. And the idea of heaven, the way that David describes it, where God is face to face with you now, oh my gosh, of course, that's what I want because that's everything in my life that feels like life. It's why we pray. I don't pray and talk to Jesus because I ought to. I don't go to church because I ought to. I go because God might show up. Right? I, I, I go and I, I, I try to put all of my, my, my walls down as much as I possibly can because I want God to show up. I want God to speak. If you've been coming here for a while, it's like I've taken time and messages before where I've told you how God has supernaturally spoken to me. And I'm not going to go over all of those things again for you. But I'll just tell you this story just real quick. There was a teenager that came and talked to me a few years ago. And they went to one of our camp experiences over the summer. And they'd been raised in the church. And in the middle of that camp experience, everybody around them was raising their hands because they're all emotionally into everything, yeah? But this one refused to. And they sat there and they prayed a silent prayer to God and said, God, would you show up for me? And all of a sudden, God did. And all of a sudden, they had this moment where they were touched by the living God. The very real, supernatural, mystical God was in the room and decided to touch them right there at that moment and give them their miracle. And as they told me their story, the tears just, oh. because when it happens like that, the tears just come. They just do. I was driving one day to Peoria, Illinois, to where, where my job was. I was on my commute, and I was on the highway, and all of a sudden, somebody came on the radio, and, and they just said this one line. They said, you know, God, he can't love you more than he already does, and he refuses to love you less. And I'd never heard it said that way before, and I'd never thought about it that way before. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came in power into the cap of my car. And I just bawled and tried to stay on the road. I had somebody hear God really clearly a few months ago, and everything in their life was all broken. 
and they needed some things to happen, didn't know how. And as they were, as they were seeking God and, and praying, God came and spoke to them and told them that in three days, exactly three days, this exact thing was going to happen and this particular person was going to do it. And when they did, everything was going to open up in their life. And they told me about it, you know, and I'm trying to be a good pastor right there in that moment and not act skeptical with them because I felt it. I felt really, really skeptical. But three days later, exactly three days later, the exact person in that person's prayer did exactly the thing God said they would do and everything opened up for them. How do you explain that? It's God showing off the very presence of God that was above the mercy seat showing up now. There's two guys. I've talked to both of them across the last year. They both come to this church and they don't know each other's stories, but they both told them, when you're a pastor, people tell you their stories. It's pretty fun. You just get exposed to a lot. So, both of these guys both grew up in the church, both grew up as pastors, with pastors for fathers. PKs, pastor's kids, which some of you already know, like that's, that's a fishy thing, right? Like that could go really bad. And it went really bad in both of these guys' cases. And it was so bad, the church was so ugly that both of them walked away from the faith. And... Again, different people, different times. And then as they were telling me their testimony, they told me the the story of how God miraculously came into their life and rescued them back to the faith. And you're sitting here hearing them them say all this and you're like, how in the world, how in the world did you get over what had been done to you? And the hypocrisy that you would see, how'd you get over that? It was like, well, God miraculously brought me here. And so there was healing in that. Do you see how God just invades? You need him to invade in your life. David experienced that and he was addicted to it. Are you addicted yet? You need to be addicted. Like, well, my experience doesn't feel that way. It needs to. Again, I'm not trying to shut you out. I'm trying to draw you in. And there'd be some that would listen to this and would say, you know, don't dangle in front of God's people some experience that they're never going to have because that could be cruel if they seek after it and it doesn't happen for them. That's wrong. If you seek after God and you seek after him, the the scripture says, seek after me, seek me with your whole heart and you will find me. Seek after God. Demand it. Be stubborn about it. Go to him angry about where's my miracle at? And I know that sounds weird to some of you, but some of you are still playing the believe game. You need to be done with it. Because this whole idea of I'm gonna spend in hev- spend heaven doing this for all of eternity, it doesn't make sense. There's a whole bunch of stuff in your Bible that doesn't make any sense to you because it's never been supernatural. You've never known God at that level and you need to be done with that old way. Okay, pastor, well, where are the three easy steps to make that happen? I don't know. I'm not here to tell you that because there's a thousand different things that are holding you back and there's a thousand different things that he might ask you to do. You're you and his relationship, his friendship with you is unique. I can tell you this, it's just like what Ricky said during the, the communion meal. It's, it's, it's not about you working harder. It's not about you taking your tools and trying to make God do something in your life. I don't mean it like that. Revelation says Jesus is knocking at the door. You're the one who has to let him in. So what have you put up in the way? So day to day, you need to seek him. Today, you need to go to God and say, God, I want this in my life. And I'm not going to let go, just like Jacob wouldn't let go of God until he got his blessing, right? I'm not going to let go until I hear your voice, until I get breakthrough, until I know you're real. And as you do, he may ask you to do things. He may give you steps to take. 
So do those things. But that's you and him. Would you guys stand? With you standing, and right before I pray, I want to read this verse to you. This is Revelation 21, 2 through 3. I told you about the city. Just, just take this in. This is, this is the city, actually. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne. That's from God himself. And he said, look, God's home is now among his people. This is how much he desires friendship and has all along. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. Verse four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one, the same one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Let's pray. Jesus, we want what you want. We want to know you. We want to experience you. The one true God, the living God. Lord, if we've had low expectations of you, if we've embraced religion because it was safe, because we felt like we were in control, if we were playing, playing some kind of imagination game with Jesus, God, I pray, Lord, that you just shine a light on that that you would forgive us, Lord. And God, now we say that we want more. So Lord, would you come and show up in our individual lives? Lord, I pray, God, that, that you would give us a moment with you that goes beyond goosebumps, Lord, that goes beyond anything that can be explained away. I pray that you would, you would show up, that you would invade, Lord, that you would speak, that you would move. And God, I don't know how you're going to do that, God, but God, for each one of us, Lord, I pray that our prayer right now would be today, God. I want this with you today. And I pray that we bring our whole hearts to you. God, for those of us, Lord, that are maybe listening to this and maybe we're, we're like, okay, I, I know what he's talking about with that addiction. I know he's talking about with those feelings because, because I used to have them. I used to have this kind of experience with God, but it was years ago, maybe it was decades ago, and it's a long time since I felt that way. God, I pray for a spirit of renewal for all of those that are in that place. And God, I pray that their faith could be just as potent and strong and vibrant today as it ever was before. Holy Spirit, you're the only one that can do any of this. We love you, God. In Christ's name.